Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Steve Tesco of Jackson. I'm one of the archivists here. Uh, I've been here a few years and I'm primarily responsible for Department of Justice, Northern Ireland Office, and the, the wider justice sector. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is obviously, as an archivist, we're responsible for the custody of the records, looking after them. So, I'm, going to be I'm not going to be giving you a history of the, the prison service or the, the, the penal system in Northern Ireland. Um, I'll be talking about the records we have, and I've actually brought a few records for you to look at at the end, um, including some of the old stuff, and then right up to the modern era, the, the, the sort of Troubles era, Northern Ireland office stuff. If you have any questions, I'm actually quite happy for you to stop me in the middle if you want, or if you want to keep at the end, give me a shout. Okay, so you're sitting in Prony, the Public Record Office, Northern Ireland. Um, we were set up under the 1923 Act. Um, it's one of the oldest pieces of legislation still going. Um, we were the official place of repository, the official repository um, for official records for the Northern Ireland. Um, in those days we were talking, archivists were only interested in the preservation of the records, not actually in making them accessible as a primary objective. Then, with things like Freedom of Information Act and Open Government before that, we got into the business of looking at making sure that the citizens had a right to access the material as important as preservation. So it's that seesaw effect that we have between making the records accessible to you and making sure they, they last. Because you can see from some of these things, um, we have a duty to conserve them because they're, 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 some, particularly the older things, can, um, can age quite badly and deteriorate. Um, why do we keep records? Why have we got all these public records? Essentially, this is just over the years, I've cobbled together a few reasons. Ultimately, to protect the archival memory of our society, to ensure organisational accountability. That's really to say, well, the MIO, why did they do things? You then can go and can, can get an insight into their decision making about something like the hunger strike or, or whatever it is. Um, to, it's legislative compliance, the Freedom of Information Act, the Data Protection Act, and the Environmental Information Regulations, these are mandatory, so we must have records and make them accessible. We have no choice. And DPA, data protection, means we have to protect living data subjects' information. So, as a lady asked me earlier about prisoner records, if the prisoner is still alive, we have a duty to protect his or her information and make it accessible to him or her only. So that's a bit like your bank, your bank details or your medical details. You would expect that you, no one else would get to see those, except with your consent. And then ultimately, why have we got records at the protect, to provide evidence of the rights, the, the obligations, the transactions, and the activities of an individual, a group, or a society. So that's a big catch-all to say we keep records for all sorts of reasons. So the right to know, I said freedom of information there, that is immensely strong for the archivist and for yourselves. You have a right to ask for anything under the sun that we have, and we have a duty to tell you, A, if we have it, and B, um, if we don't have it, why we don't have it. And if you can't see it, there has to be a good reason why you can't see it. Um, the the re request for information in writing, as long as they're in writing, email or, or a letter, they can come from anywhere in the world, anyone, member of the public, family member, representative groups like Wave Trauma, who deal with, particularly with the conflict here, um, solicitors can act on your behalf, uh, media, academics, police, all sorts of things. We have some records, the ones you see here are all open, they've got green stickers. Ultimately, we're in the business of releasing as much as we can on the Freedom of Information Act. The word freedom is the key part of this. We are trying, as the National Archive for Northern Ireland, to release as much as we can feasibly without harming someone or breaching some exemption, which I'll touch on. Some records, however, are fully closed or partially closed. The example I gave about prisoner records. Prisoner records, if they're a living prisoner, then you would understand yourself just like your doctor's, your GP file, or your um, your whatever bank details, they should not be released to anyone except that person. So some things will be fully closed. Um, some things might be partially closed, and that's when you see sometimes blanking out. One of our files, you might see little bits will be taken out, like some uh, uh, someone's address or something like that. And uh, the exemptions I said, there, there might be some reasons why we don't release stuff. Most of that's data protection, personal information. Like I said, you're political persuasion, your sexuality, your family details, your children's educational standards, your medical details, all that stuff is protected and shouldn't be released and we have a duty to protect that. There might be other things as well. Um, in this country you'd have physical mental safety of a witness to a murder, you might have um, uh, something with the border and there might be something protected in national security or something like that. But generally a lot of this stuff is personal information, particularly in the prison environment. 
And then obviously we have a, we have a duty to tell you clearly in plain English, I'm a big fan of plain English, there's lots of legislation floating about in here, but the key is that we have to communicate to you in plain English and say why you cannot see it. And the biggest thing you have is the right to appeal. You can go back and say, I do not like this, I want to appeal this. And then subject access, that is where if you are the, the person whose data it alludes to and you're still alive, you can ask us for that and no one else has a right to see that stuff. So particularly if you're a former prisoner, someone involved in the court case, a witness, uh, it is your medical reports, if we have those. Might be service records, there's not a lot of those to be fair, and witnesses. That kind of thing is where you might be the person who's, I know most of our records are dealing with historical and it tends to be people who are no longer going to be, but there, there can be those cases. So then I'll get stuck into the actual archives we have that relate to prison records and um, the first couple of things here you'll see are what we call the HMP, Her Majesty's Prison Archive. So they're just a very really good illustration of these things. I'm 6'2 and they're big, they're in suitcases. And our staff have to lift these off the shelves all the time to search through them. At the end you can have a wee look. That is the equivalent of what we now have as prisoner files. Every time a prisoner came in, they were entered into this register, admission register. This one's for the Crumlin Road. No, I'm sorry, this is our This is the women's prison. And that's Crumlin Road Jail uh, for the early 1900s. <coughs> so with that, they're a fantastic source for essentially family history. A lot of the people asking to see this stuff are looking to trace great-grandmothers, great-grandfathers, whoever it is. It'll give details of the prisoners, the name, the address, the date of birth, transfer between institutions, borstal to prison, prison to prison, prison ship, things like that. Um, what, what the sentence was, what their, what they, did they have distinguishing marks, tattoos and things, so they could be recognized if they skipped. Um, and um, discharge, ultimately when it came to them completing their sentence or if they died. Um, we also have lots of other things. The visiting committees uh, are very interesting. But I don't think I've included one there. I've, get, I, I've given you one on the, 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 the medical aspect of prisoners. Obviously, these are these are all dead, dead subjects. But what we have is um, visiting committee records where the committees would have a duty to make sure the prisoners, as they do now, are looked after and they had physical, physically humane conditions. And so they would report back to the to the governors on the conditions of the prisoners, and the prisoners could complain. A bit like the prisoner ombudsman now would have a rule to say, listen, I do not like this, or my, my room's too cold, or I, the, the food's uncooked. They would, they would note that down. We have governor's journals. We have uh, visit, visitors' registers from about 1870, late 1870s up to the 1980s. So there's quite a lot of stuff there. Records for education, religion, and punishment of prisoners. Photographs and glass plates of, not for everyone, but for a lot of the prisoners we have glass plates and photographs for, for, for the male and female. Then we have um, some other stuff, there's some quirky stuff in there in the HMP archive. Um, there's a 1961 account of the execution of Robert McLattery, who was the last, December 1961, he was executed, he was the last guy to, to get the capital sentence carried out. Um, we have the Lauren Attorney's 1922 ration book, so the Lauren internment camp was where they, where they sent people in 1922. Um, we have a list of attorneys for what was called the Al Rauda. The Al Rauda was a prison ship. There was a couple of prison ships in our history, and they, 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 they were where they were. Put. That was actually a medical prison ship. So we have a list of attorneys um, who were who, uh, in the Second World War. Uh, people were interned for different reasons. In the Second World War, a lot of it was um, a lot of them were Republican, but they might have been communist. Anyone who was seen as a potential threat to the state in, in the midst of fighting Germany. Um, Photos of Mays Long Cash, the, the two sites, we have photos of that. And we actually, strangely, surreally, we have a list of movies that were shown in the Mays. And it's kind of um, lots of, it's interesting just going through seeing all the films that were shown. Um, what, uh, the Great Escape isn't actually one of them, because I was looking, <laughs> was looking at it and going, I wonder actually will the Great Escape be here? It's not. I wondered, and I never found it that they actually forbid that to be seen. Um, so that's the HMP. That's very useful. And again, at the end, if you have a wee look, give me a shout if you want to ask anything about it. Other archives then, Cabinet Secretariat. This is a grand name for the, for the, for the sort of top of the tree. At the time, from 1922 onwards, you've got some very interesting subject files there because the Cabinet, um, all the departments, the Ministry is responsible, including Justice um, and Prisons, responded to, or re reported to the Cabinet, just like, I suppose, like the Assembly, now the Executive. Um, 
or in theory. Um, so here, basically what you've got is things like, uh, things that have a peripheral environment in the, in the penal system, justice, uh, civil and home defense war plans, so you have war zone and courts, strangely, you have courts trial, uh, to, to, to try uh, prisoners in a war zone, invasion planning, which would have included what we do with prisoners if Germ Germany attacks us and invades us, and then legal, military and police matters from 1922. You've got lots of things involved in the sort of the general uh, issue of uh, prisons and penal system and illegality. Right, this one's a big one. So the Home Affairs Archive, the Ministry of Home Affairs was the predecessor to the NAO. Before the NAO in 1972, the Ministry of Home Affairs ran all the stuff to do with um, justice and policing. So they assumed responsibility under the Government of, of Ireland Act, and again, like I said, until direct rule with the NAO, they were in charge of things here. You've got some great archives here under the, 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 the cover of HA. HA5 is the general H files that were called internee files from the early internment from 1922. Um, general files relating to things like the treatment of internees, their behaviour, conditions aboard the prison ship Argenda. Um, the prison ship Argenda is like the all rider, it was another ship that was brought in because they didn't have the room to put all the internees. There was huge amounts of people in through these. And it was it was um, it was left in, in Loch Ney and it caused all sorts of problems. HA9 is the, is, is the prison branch files. So that's lots of prisoners who were there from the, from the sort of period just up the Second World War. Um, then we have a couple, actually, to be fair, this slide is one of my older ones. These are now recatalogued, so ignore those. And this is updated. So yes, HA32 is the next interesting one. HA32, the secret files. This was the Home Affairs secret files. There's some cracking stuff in there if you were to do some research on maybe your, 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 your family or more particularly that sort of uh, the running of things like the Argenta and the Lauren internment camp. Um, you've got stuff like uh, special powers legislation, censorship of prisoners' letters, especially from the Lauren place of internment camp, as it was officially called. So it's all the issues of what they were doing to the prisoners' letters. Um, uh, lots on the prison ship Argenta from 1922 to 24. Um, like there was a hunger strike on board, uh, there was a plot to destroy it by explosives, there was, there was complaints from the local fisheries. That their the refuse being dumped off their agenda was polluting their fishery beds, Accident, accidental collisions with another ship, and uh, photographs. So, some good stuff there if you were actually to, to do some research on it. The next one then, Central Secretariat, that's more up to date. That's the stuff you might see if you are following. The, uh, twice a year we do a release of files from the 1980s and 90s. This year we've just released the 1991 files. Central Secretariat then, and the head of the Civil Service Archive below that ran all the stuff in the current period, 80s and 90s, the run-up to the peace process. There's some fascinating stuff here if you're focused on that side of the world. You've got security meetings with the Secretary of State and all the ministers, and the, 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 the political development group and the political affairs division. These were the, the, the NAO officials who were extremely adept at assessing all the situation here, be it security, politics, uh, playing off people against each other, politicians against each other, fascinating stuff. But in the terms of the prison stuff, you've got some very interesting stuff there. In the aftermath of the anglo Irish Agreement, there was the anglo Irish Intergovernmental Conference, which led to the talks, which built to the peace talks. And you've got one of the, obviously, as it is now, one of the major strands is security, what happens to political prisoners, and issues there as they are now of it. And one of the files I've left out for you is on the Irish language in prisons and identity, cultural identity and all that stuff. Um, so th those are very useful if you want to do less about your, it would be less, they would not have the prisoner files themselves, but it would be more about the actual policy and the actual issues of the rationale behind why, why the NA was doing stuff. Then you have the Mother Archive. This is the big one in terms of our, the Troubles era. The NA Archive is huge and you can see here, I'll go through three pages of this. It's, um, it's a massive, set of issues covered if you were to do study or to, 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 to investigate what the thinking was between, behind the government uh, running the country here in terms of the security. So, a combination of building works, this was things like the maze, well, maze compound and cellar as they were called. The compound was obviously the first one and then they, they built the H blocks. Incident report files, daily situation reports, sometimes in official parents, the, the more mundane the file title, the more interesting it is. The amount of times I've seen a miscellaneous security matters file, 
and it's the one that's got all the gold dust in it for the researchers. Um, major incident files sometimes, riot, death, escape, protest, all those things that are happening, particularly in the political prisoner uh, um, prison. Future planning, what they were going to do when they wanted to close the maze, and when they were looking to build things like Magabra. Security, this is a big one for people, there's a lot of researchers who are interested in certain things like um, f uh, female strip search, for example, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting for certain of those who are studying human rights. And uh, there's lots of files on the issue of strip search protocol, particularly in our Armagh prison. Escape prevention, they were using all sorts of technology to try and spot these tunnels, except in one instance where they didn't need anything. The soldiers were walking along, and I, I was reading the file, and it's, it's there in black and white. They were walking along, and the lights started shining up from the earth, <laughs> and the tunnel, the, the loyalist tunnel, had literally been too close to the surface, and the soldiers just stood in it, and the loyalist was below. So it was arrested. Um, so you've got all that stuff in there. It's quite interesting. The smuggling and possession of illegal material, obviously, to give them. You've got confiscated material, um, uh, like letters, yeah. coded letters, explosives, weapons, mock weapons. Um, our colleagues in the justice uh, side, uh, they have an archive, and we'll be benefiting from the historical records that come from them. But they have some very interesting artifacts. And one of those is a, is a mock weapon. It was made up out of bits of wood in their, their, their handicraft class to show them how to weapons train. <coughs> Tunnel discovery, military attacks in prison, you know, it's the garrison that was protecting the prison ultimately. Um, and escape fights, you know, this would be things like, again, I've got one there on the, the so-called Great Escape, the 1983 mass escape of Republican prisoners. We have all very big um, files on that. Prisoner complaints, that's more the, the idea I mentioned there of, of the visiting committees. That um, they had uh, you know, things like the Red Cross and Amnesty and priests and ministers would all come in on these visiting uh, committees to, to assess whether there was, uh, particularly when it came to the special category protests, when there was a lot of complaints about the uh, conditions. Statistical reports, which is typical of, of government departments, reporting back how many prisoners are loyalists, how many are Catholic, how many are uh, disabled, or whatever it is. Uh, parole and resettlement, and that also is, there's prerogative of mercy files. And then interception and censorship of letters. It's interesting because of the, the, there was that role in the prison to, uh, to confiscate letters and check them before they were issued to the family. And as I said there, you've got the different aspects of the visiting. Journalists and politicians, I omitted, yes, you've got the, the politicians would make, and, and the NAO did for, for a good while, was trying to prevent the likes of Sinn Féin coming in to visit their prisoners. And you've got, it's interesting reading the letters between the, the NAO and Whitehall and Stormont saying why they, with the rationale behind why we, do, we shouldn't let them in, etc. etc. Special category protest covers all those issues when they started um, the blanket, the dirty, and then ultimately the hunger protest. And then we have the files, and there's one there, obviously the redacted versions, um, censored versions of the death of the hunger strikers as they were medically deteriorating. Then. Um, they, they, they report it in that daily. So we have those. And um, some of the files are protected, like I said earlier, some of them are fully closed. And there's a reason for that because some of them are highly sensitive. And irrespective of who they are or where they came from, we have a duty to protect under confidentiality, essentially the Hippocratic Oath. If a prisoner was dying slowly and there's a file, about a telephone book sized file on their medical condition, even if they're dead now, it doesn't automatically mean we release it to the public. There's a sensitivity issue there. And we, that one, in conjunction with the Department of Health and Northern Ireland Office, we agreed to release it just to the family of the deceased prisoner, just so it's not seen as um, um, uh, um, distasteful, I suppose. We have issues of more interesting issues, legal issues about untried prisoners, high-risk prisoners, the so-called, they have different names for them, so-called converted, we would be familiar with supergrass um, uh, prisoners, prisoners who have been encouraged by government to, to, to inform their colleagues. And then all the fascinating issues of legal, um, the European C Convention on Human Rights, and the UK at the time was as it is now, considering certain derogations where they basically effectively stepped out of certain obligations under human rights, and the special category debate about you know prisoner of war versus criminal, and the NAO would have had one view, and obviously prisoners and prisoner groups would have had a different view. Fascinating debates there. Other legal issues, emergency powers and uh, prevention of terrorism acts, the Mental Health Act, there's a number of those, the Geneva Convention, and, and as I said, the POW status, the issue of a prisoner of war, and whether this was, that they were combatants 
use the American term. And here's the second page, there's lots more. Um, you've got the campaign for loyalist segregation. I've got a file on that there. Um, the discipline and punishment files, the education and training files, religion, use of Irish, again, as it is now, it's a, it's a contentious issue there. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in that in terms of allowing um, things like Gaelic to be played, they were debating that. Uh, the Bibles to be translated into Irish, etc. And they were concerned that they didn't have the translation facilities to make sure that there weren't codes being passed between uh, the various um, prisoners. Then you've got the official side, you've got the prison, officer, the prison officers association and all the, the, the governors, the medical staff, all the people who served and were threatened and were killed. So you've got lots of stuff on the, on the threat assessments, the risk. And the SPED, which was the, the they had a, a system um, you might be familiar with, which was the special purchase of evacuated dwellings. Basically someone had to go under death threat from their house overnight might have been a prison officer and the, the government effectively had almost invested it, they bought it and they, they moved to another location. Governor's annual reports, maze compound closure, that was one thing I found and, uh, I've got an image of that actually, just of the of the, the document that was effectively saying we need to close the compound and move to the H blocks. It was a more modern environment. Um, the Great Escape as they called it, the, the mass escape of 1983, Sir James Hennessy was asked to investigate this and this is where they looked at the physical failings of the maids and what went wrong. And then we've got lots of Secretary of State cases, Royal Prerogative of Mercy cases, which made the news a couple of years ago, um, uh, where uh, the parliamentary questions and all the sort of top level debates about who's right and who's wrong and what, what should we do with, with uh, the political prisoner issue. And then, then, as I said earlier, we have the actual prisoner files. We have mountains of them, obviously. And there's the internee files, and there's convicted prisoners. So if you or anyone you know is interested in that side, you can give us a shout because we, we deal with a lot of those and that's where you or your, your, your loved one or whoever it is might say, listen, I want or my solicitor wants to, come, to, to, to have my file and you can contact us with that. And that will not go anywhere except to you. That's protected so there'll be no concern just because we have it that we would release it. It would only be for yourself. I've got a couple of images there. Again, unfortunately, they're all, they're all from the modern files, so there's nothing, there's no fantastic uh, uh, photographs, but there are a couple of interesting little documents. The first one is um, from Humphrey Atkins, Secretary of State to uh, Thomas Sophie. It's, it's noting um, Thomas Sophie's initial concerns from the 20th of February about a second, second hunger strike, and the dates of this is, it's kind of 1st of March, was the start of the second hunger strike. The first one had been 1980, just at the end of 1980, in Armagh and Mays. And this then is the MAO responding, saying, we know your concerns. And effectively, it's, again, the conditions of the hunger strikers and the potential for the second hunger strike to be more effective than the first one, which it was. The second one is a meeting between relatives of hunger strikers who were actually on active hunger strike and Lord Gowrie, who was the Minister of State for Northern Ireland at the NAO. And you've got a couple of revealing comments. Just um, this relative, Mr. McWilliams, yeah, he's the uncle of Jared Hodgkins. Um, and he had noted, um, thought the conflict had developed into a battle of wits as to who, who could endure the longer. And that was, that was conveyed to the NAO quite strongly that this was going to become a staring contest between the prisoners and the and the, the, the system, the authorities. This one is a 1984 NAO memo from um, NAO Belfast, noting the allocation of political prisoners. This is where they were basically split them, deciding where to put them. In terms of the segregation argument and the various pros and cons of allowing them to segregate, but also acknowledging that it's justifying the special status, which was contrary to what they were saying. They were, and I was trying to paint them as criminals, and the, the different wings, if you divide them, you were acknowledging their special status, not just normal prisoners. So it was a tricky one for them to handle. So effectively they were saying, you know, in most of the blocks we're going to give A and B wing to the Republicans, and C and D to the Loyalists, and then there, there might be some, well, some mixed prisoners. Handicrafts um, is, 1984 is so post escape, and what they were saying here was that there were things in the handicraft class that were going on that maybe weren't supposed to go on. Um, it can see a camera, a couple of watches hidden in the false, one actually wired for use 
in a, in a improvised explosive device um, in a false bottom in a dual case. And then they noted somewhere here that, yes, the, 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 the majority of the officers who were injured during the mass escape had actually been injured by the handling graft tools. So there, were, there was a point there that was saying, listen, we understand. And this, this sort of contrasts with the human rights Red Cross and Amnesty view, which is you've got to give the prisoners the rights to exercise, handicraft, uh, mixing, but at the same time they're saying, right, well, we give them handicraft, but if they're going to use the tools to, to do all sorts of things. Um, and so this is the debate that we're having in these files day and daily. Yes, this is the Loyalist and non-conforming prisoners. So this is where they, they were, the, the NAO actually was occasionally, you could see them saying, we are trying to get them some education. So they were concerned particularly with the OU, the Open University, and the, um, the, the remedial education. And they were saying effectively some of the people had signed up, but because they were non-conforming prisoners, they were in political protest for segregation. They were saying this is going to damage it. So there was people in there in the education side of the NAO, and the, the prison itself were saying, listen, Folks, individual prisoners' education is getting hammered here because they're part of the NCP, the, the non conforming protest. This one is March 1981 again, just about the time of the start of the uh, couple of weeks into the, first, the second hunger strike. <coughs> it's where the occasionally what you get is the political affairs division and political uh, political development group are are the, the brains of the outfit. These are the people who assess go to meet the people after dinners, talk to the SDLP, all the politicians, and assess threat, opportunity, all those things. And these shady characters come out of meetings and then convey what the, what the view is in the situation. And it was basically Eddie McGrawley, who was then the chief whip, saying that the, the although there's not a huge amount of base sympathy for the hunger strike reasons as it is, the weaker they get physically, the stronger the emotion will get and the stronger the support will get. So they were basically saying Eddie McGrady was accepting if you let this go on, it'll become a base support. It'll become more emotive, not just a black and white um, reason for a um, special uh, uh, protest. This one gets into the sort of notion that they were accepting that they were stuck between a rock and a hard place with segregation. To, ag to agree with segregation, recognize as he says here, sorry, he or she, um, a major step towards recognition political motivation for crimes. So it would accept the fact that they were politically motivated, even when the enemy was saying they were criminals. Uh, it would increase the power and influence of the paramilitaries in the prisons, by accepting them that they would control their, effectively control their wings. And they wouldn't be as they wanted to call them, would be criminals. And that then they had another problem, which I you know, assume did eventually come to fruition, which was they would subdivide. So, you know, UVF and LVF and all, all the different units or groups would, would, would subdivide and, and have their own wings. And that then led to what they dreaded, which was an inevitable loss of full control, as they saw it, for the prison authorities. And then that's just um, closure options for the compound. The compound was the old prison. Uh, they were looking to the cellular setup, the, the inch block. And obviously, this is post the Hennessy report, so it was post the escape. So they were accepting that the H block was not perfect, but that, um, that they still had concerns about the old compound, and that was, that was when they were effectively shutting that down. Okay, this one is a meeting between the Secretary of State Northern Ireland and he had a security committee. So what they were saying was this was just the ramifications of Hennessy, and this is all the physical changes to the maze and what they were needing to change. Um, I don't think they probably ever got it right because the Billy Wright assassination so was proved that they still physically things were missing in the links to, to, to stop people doing things, escaping or jumping over fences. So um, that's just revealing the sort of the different people who would have been involved there. You know, you, 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 if there's not just official bureaucrats, you get different representatives there. Reverend Foster, Mr. Seabright, and whatnot. And this one is to try and add a slightly lighter note. Um, post the 83 escape, there was obviously lots and lots, there were files for the correspondence from people on all sides of the spectrum here saying about the escape, right or wrong, disgraceful, fantastic, all this, writing to the Prime Minister or the Secretary of State. This wee fella was 10 years old, he's from England, that's all I can confirm, and he had written in, having watched the news, and came up with a solution, which was, and it is written to Thatcher, it is written to the Prime Minister, so 
The tail end of this, which I haven't scanned, is the Prime Minister's private secretary writing back to a 10 year old boy who was trying to help, who came up with a maze maze, which is <laughs> a maze of walls. It's genius because what he's actually done is, in, and I did this as a kid too, when I was drawing castles, I spent hours making, making the bricks, so I, I can see the wee fellows at the tent. He's got the watchtower with the camera and the spotlight. He's got the maze here with the camera and the windows and the door, and then they get confused and they can't see it. But he's thought of the Good Friday Agreement because he's actually got the exit, so he has actually acknowledged that someone has to leave eventually. But the wee fellow, but what was, I suppose I should scan in the future, is the private secretary coming back and calling him, dear Mr. So-and-so, we acknowledge your concerns for the security of the maze. Um, the Prime Minister is on to this, and Sir James Hennessy has done his report. He's 10 years old, and you're sort of thinking, well, could they not have had a little bit of humour with the wee fella? But um, that, that, that was basically this kid's uh, solution to the situation after we escaped. So. And finally, um, we have all the other wee things in the archive that are contribute to the general picture. Some of them are on the table there. The plans of the Common Road Jail, which were given to us last year with the DOJ, Department of Justice, which were great. So we've got court records. So under Act 4, the yeah, Antrim Court, Crown Court, we've got Section 4. That covers the bride wells. The bride wells are these little places. Um, the, the, the theory is it was named after St. Bride's Well in London, where there was a prison beside this little place. I don't actually know who St. Bride was, but the, the, the prevailing theory, certainly in the Oxford English Dictionary, which I double checked, um, is that there was, a, there was a place of incarceration. A bride, bride well, according to the police force, can be anywhere that you have a cell. That you can be put away. But the bridles were sort of predecessor, if you think of it like that, they were pre, pre the, the official prisons. We've got plans of Belfast Jail in there as well, which again, there's a couple of them I chose just um, to, to put in front of you. Court records, obviously, we have the court records. So in Belfast, section one, we have the details of the convicts sent in the early 1900s, but obviously, we have for court records across the province, we have all the court records of those who were, who were convicted. We have some more jail plans under the local council for Antrim. We have lots of privately deposited stuff. So if people like yourselves might give us your family records, you might have been a former solicitor, you might have been a representative prisoner, or you might just have stuff from a, your family might, might have had a, might, you might be a governor, and you might have given us records. And they're offered to us day and daily, so we take stuff gratefully. And so there's all sorts of things in there. Oh, but there's an 1828 letter about a possible building of a prison in Belfast. Um, government information service photographs on the prisons and the maze on the gathering. We even have probably the weather that was happening on the day. If you need to check our meteorological archive, we can probably tell you if it was raining on a certain day. Um, and there's a small number of official records, such as things like finance, um, education, community relations, policy co coordinating, where they have involvement in either building a prison or concern about education or something like that. So there's all those other issues you can look at. And then the positive note is that we are working very closely with the Department of Justice now, particularly their prison archive, to bring in lots more. And some of these things in front of you will be the start, uh, the start of that. So it's a developing relationship where we're, we're bringing in some stuff that they have, and there's some great stuff coming in. And that'll be the next step. We get that in and catalog it and make it available. So um, that is really a whirlwind through prison records. Does anyone have any questions?